Welcome back to John 6, Lesson 74. You know, I'm excited because I want to go over here to Mindy's painting. You know, Mindy is painting uh, the seven I am's. And today in John 6, it's our first I am. Kevin, you want to guess which one I am it is? Is it, uh, is it this, 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 or this? It's actually the bread <laughs> or right. <laughs> it's called the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Seven times, actually he says it multiple times, I am fill in the blank. And in John 6, 35, that's where we're going to go. We're going to begin to unpack what in the world is he talking about? I am the bread of life. Now here's the deal. Jesus is going to say a whole lot of tough comments. This text today, he's going to say some hard truths that's radically going to leave people scratching their heads saying, do I really want to do this or not? And so basically what we're going to do is, is in John 6, the feeding of the 5,000, I think it's only appropriate because, guys, what did they feed at the feeding of the 5,000? Bread. bread. Yeah, he didn't say, I am the fish. He says, I am the bread. Yeah, that would be a little bit awkward, but, you know, hey. But at the feeding of the 5,000, bread and fish. And so verses 1 through 21, that's what he talks about. So that's the backdrop, okay, as we begin to unfold this story. But how I want to unfold this story is, is through my old friend, never met him in my life, Warren Wearsby. Warren Wearsby gives the responses of the crowd from verses 22 all the way through 71. We're going to give you four types of responses and then fill in the gaps in between. And so what you're going to see, the very first response as Jesus begins uh, this story in John 6, 22, is first of all, the crowd is seeking him. Okay, they're seeking. Watch, it says in John 6, 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea, they knew there had only been one boat. It says they also knew that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Verse 23, some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they ate the bread after the Lord gave thanks. Remember all of this, you know, after a big miracle or, you know, after a big Super Bowl win or after some big party, like, you know what I mean? Like it just, there's some, something that, that's just, people are still excited. They're still hyped up. They're still feeling something that's going on. And it says in verse 24, when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and they went into Capernaum looking for Jesus. So they are seeking Jesus. Okay, that's a really key thing. Now, I will just tell you in Hebrews 11, verse 6, if you'll go there, Kevin, this theme of seeking is we should all be there. Let's just call that out. As a, as a crowd, as a follower, we should all be seeking him. At the very end of Hebrews 11, 6, it says, For the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. Now, let's go to the Old Testament for a second. Let's go to Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Jeremiah 29, verse 13, has the same mentality. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So this approach of the crowd seeking Jesus, it's clearly biblical. We don't know their motives yet, so I'm not going to go there yet. But I just want to start off by saying, as a response to the crowd, we should all be seeking him. Again, I'm not going to question their motives yet. Now, think about Matthew 6, verse 33. This was the very first... Uh, you know, six chapters that we talked about in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 6, 33 says this, But seek, what? First the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all of these things will be added for you. So if your mindset is that you're seeking the kingdom of God, if you're seeking His righteousness, then these things are going to be taken care of. So that's the mentality of constantly seeking Him. Now, let's, let's go to Solomon, because I think this is really, really important. Go to Proverbs 8, verse 17. I want us to understand this is biblical. We should all be seeking him. I love those who love me and those who search for me. What? Find me. What an awesome approach. What an awesome truth that we begin to see in John 6. Feeding the 5,000 had just taken place. Now here we go. It says in verse 25. Remember, they're seeking him and praise the Lord. What happens? They found him. When they found Jesus on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Like, we don't understand. We saw the boats. We didn't see you there. I don't understand. And he says in verse 26, <laughs> he just goes right for the jugular. It's kind of crazy. I assure you, Jesus answered, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. I can't believe this. You only came because you think I'm a food truck. You only came because you think I can provide food for you at any given time. Like, that's why you're following me. That's why you're seeking me. That's why you're pursuing me. And Jesus clearly says, I can give you, there's two things right here. One is 
food for the, the, the body. But you guys, there's so much more. There's food for the inner man. One commentator says this, and I love what Wiersbe says, is that he says there's body that sustains life and then there's food for the inner man that gives life. And that's what he begins to unpack in verse 27. He says, don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Now, now do you hear this language even a little bit more from John 5 yesterday about how the Father testifies about the Son? It's like you'll begin to see more and more of this in the Gospel of John. The Father, God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Guys, we need to have this eternal mindset. Matthew 6, verse 20 He's telling you guys, you guys, you have to seek food that brings eternal life. So I don't want you to put your investments, but collect for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. Look in verse 21. Here's what I want you to do. For your treasure is there, your heart will be. I want you to invest in things that's going to eternally last. This is where I want you to find, uh, like you're, you're seeking. This is where I want you to pursue. And just one more. Can you go to 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18? Keep our mindset eternal. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now here's what I love, okay? Classic crowd that's seeking Jesus with wrong motives. In verse 28, they say this, what can we do to perform the works of God, they ask. In other words, oh great, just show us what do I need to do in order to obtain this life. Like, that's the mindset. And I think a lot of times, you guys, without even saying this, this is what we communicate in the church in America. You come to me, you do X, Y, and Z, you'll get X, Y, and Z's answer. Like, this is the mentality. This is the mindset. And Wearsby says they thought they had to work for salvation. They thought that they literally had to earn it. In verse 29 of John 6, he says, this is the work of God. In other words, if I could just put a new parenthesis on this, this is a work of God, not your work, but this is my work, so that you would believe in the one he has sent. Now remember, you guys, at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, we talked about some key words that are over and over again. Signs, and one of the other words is believe. So that you, this is the work of God, so that you would believe in the one he has sent. I mean, I, we, could, we could literally hang our hat on this for the rest of the message. What does he mean by believe? Well, Acts 16, verse 31, Kevin, if you'd go there, says, uh, so they said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Uh, John 14, verse 1. John 14, verse 1 has the same mentality, same truth. Your heart must not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. There's that equality of the Father and the Son, of God and Jesus. So then it says in verse 30, they're, they're kind of confused at this point. In John 6, verse 30, it says, What sign then are you going to do so we may see and believe you? They asked, what are you going to perform? In other words, now they're seeking Jesus, but as they're seeking Jesus, they're seeking signs. This was a common mindset with the Jewish people. They were constantly looking for a sign. In 1 Corinthians 1, verse 22, it just says that. Like, this is the mindset that they have. For the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. I mean, they had just experienced the feeding of the 5,000. They had just experienced bread literally covering the mountainside. And now they wanted another one. Come on, Jesus, show us. Show us right now. Uh, we want to see who you really are. And it says in verse 31, Our fathers, they ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. In other words, if, if it, <laughs> God really did it, then why don't you do it? If God provided, our Father did it back then, and our fathers participated in eating the manna from heaven, He gave them bread. I love this. Don't you love this? I mean, what are they implying right here? You need to show up and do it as well. Kind of that feeding 5,000 people from five loaves isn't enough because He had something to start with. Okay, they're reciting Psalm 78, verse 24. Think about this. It's kind of a cool picture here. Psalm 78, verse 24, it says, He rained manna for them to eat. He gave them grain from heaven. So they're literally reciting, because they obviously didn't experience this, right? They're reciting the psalmist and saying, Hey, look, you, the Father, God, brought down manna. He gave them grain from heaven. And it, it's kind of like this, I need you to show up. 
It's not the Elijah. Is Elijah, you guys, remember when he was on, uh, what was the mountain rich where the fire fell on the prophets? Carmel. Yeah, Mar Mount Carmel. Remember that? There was just like a head to head. I know that's not what they're implying, but it sure feels like it. It sure feels like, Jesus, I need you to show up and give me a sign. In verse 32, here's what he says. He says, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. So in other words, they're implying necessarily maybe it was more from Moses than from the father. And in verse 33, he says, for the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This phrase who comes down from heaven, at least depends who you look at and how you look, how you look at it. Four times or seven times, you're going to see in the Gospel of John. And what this is, is this is truly a shadow of the substance to come. So here he's saying that bread that came from the Father is really a shadow of the one to come. Now watch, Kevin, if you'll go to Colossians 2, verse 17. So he's saying what you saw back then, you guys, now there's something else that's going to come and give life. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is the Messiah. So these things constantly are pointing to, and remember, isn't that what we saw in John 5? These things testify. John the Baptist, the Father, Jesus' works, Scripture. All of these things serve, and they point to the coming uh, of, of the Son of God. Same thing in Colossians 2.17. So in verse 34, this is what they say. They say, Sir, give us this bread always. This is the kind of bread that we want. We don't want to have to keep asking for bread. I mean, this story makes me think of John 4, the woman at the well. Same mentality. John 4, verse 15. Kevin, if you would. Well, man, that would be great. Just give us this bread. Wouldn't that be awesome? <laughs> Sir, the woman said, this is John 4, verse 15. The woman said to him, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. <laughs> and then it goes in John 6, 34. Give us this bread always. Like, this is... This would be great. Like, we don't have to go to Walmart anymore to do drive through or order ahead of time. We don't have to go to Costco. We don't have to go to Sam's. Like, just this would be awesome. Give us this bread always. And then here it is, you guys. As they're seeking, Jesus drops the first I am in Scripture. And what does he say? I am the bread of life. Now, this is one of the seven I am's. This is the beginning stage that Mindy has painted here. I am the bread of life. And this is the best. Nobody who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty. There's this language with the bread of life that sounds a little bit controversial, and I love it. What does he say? You have to come to me, and what does he say? You have to believe. There's this come and believe mentality that Wearsby says you got to come to Christ and at the same time you got to yield yourself before him. Okay, I want to I want to really begin to unpack this. Now remember in the I am statements, okay? He is equating himself to God by saying I am in fact go to Exodus 3 verse 14, Kevin. In any Jewish person that studies the scriptures that testify, right? They would know this. God replied to Moses, Remember, Moses is like, hey, who do you say that, who, who should I tell him that sent me? And he says, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So now, as the son of God, he is clearly saying, I am, he's equating himself back to Exodus, and he's saying, I am the bread of life. I am that substance. I am what can provide. Now, here's the great, here, this is crazy to me, you guys. In this process, this bread, okay? He is saying, I am everything that you need. And in verse 36, but he said, but as I told you, you've seen me and yet you do not believe. <sighs> Even though they're seeking him. Isn't that the craziest thing? They're seeking him and yet they don't get it. In verse 37 through 40, it's this process of, as one commentator says, personal salvation. He begins to unfold. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. Whew, here we go. It's almost like we're going to start talking about predestination. I'm not. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. So do you get this? The Father is the one who gives Jesus everybody, right? He, everyone the Father gives to me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will never cast out. And so here it is. You ready? I'm just going to go one little phrase. There's divine sovereignty and human responsibility. That's what this says. Everybody the Father gives me will actually come to me. So we know that God has chosen them, but yet they're still going to come to him. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. In verse 38, 
For I've come down from heaven, not to do my will, praise the Lord, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should not lose none of those he's given me, but should raise them up on the last day. You go after the one. You leave the 99 and you find the one, every one that God has given to Christ. And in verse 40, for this is the will of the Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Yes, in verse 37, it's talking about predestination. They're talking about sovereignty of the Lord. And then in verse 40, here we have the human responsibility side. And you're kind of like, it's a really, really teeter-tottering act. I mean, it's one of those things that just goes this way and then this way. Some of you all lean this way and then you just hang there and it feels honestly a little lopsided. But then some are like, oh, the human responsibility side. And then you're like, well, God doesn't have anything to do with it. And then you're like, whoa, that's totally wrong too. And I just think, you guys, what I see in John 6, verse 37 through 40, you know what I see? I see a balanced approach of God's sovereignty and human responsibility. Now, I will tell you this. We could unpack this for probably 16 weeks. <laughs> I'm not going to. My emphasis today is that Jesus is saying, oh, by the way, people are seeking me. And as they're seeking me, he wants them to understand, I am the bread of life. That is what you should seek. This is who you should pursue, not the signs, not the miracles, but me. Kind of makes me feel like the religious again when he says, look, you guys have been reading scripture over and over again, but you're not even seeking me. You're seeking this, but that doesn't give you life. It says in verse 41, we begin to see the crowd and how they respond to Jesus's words. The crowd begins to, you ready for this one? Murmur. There's some murmuring going on. It says in verse 41, therefore the Jews started complaining about him. Now this sounds like the Old Testament Jews, doesn't it? Ah, it's like good to be back home. Therefore the Jews started complaining about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. <laughs> in verse 42 it says, they were saying, isn't this Jesus the son of Joseph? Again, here's the claims again that we've been reading whose father and mother we know, oh, we know them. They're from Nazareth. He's not the bread of life. I was his neighbor. <laughs> How could he now say I've come down from heaven? I mean, you have to say it would be a little radical. Imagine if all of a sudden you, you live next to the guy and this time he's like, hey, I'm, I'm the son of God. Remember, if you know and recognize all the things that have testified about him, you would realize that this is the son of God. But because the hearts were hardened, uh, because of all of the, man, whew, do we have time? We don't have time. I'm just going to say this. For right now, their hearts were hardened. Their hearts were hardened to, to see who he is. And in fact, it says in verse 43, after he's hearing all these stuff, Jesus just calls him out. He says, stop complaining among yourselves. Dear Lord, do you think he ever said that? <laughs> no one can come to me, he says in verse 44, unless the, man, unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets. Here we go. He's, he's paraphrasing Isaiah 54, verse 13. And they will all be taught by God. It's written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. So again, what is he doing? He's using the Old Testament scriptures and he's pointing people back to what the prophets say. It's crazy enough as the scripture continues to unfold. In verse 46, it says, Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. I assure you, anyone who believes, anyone who believes has eternal life. And then he says it again in verse 48. So not only did he say, I'm the bread of life in verse 35, but he also says, is it, says it Excuse me, in verse 48, I am the bread of life. I am your substance. I am your everything that you need. In verse 49, your fathers, this is crazy, ate the man in the wilderness that came, yes, from the father, but oh, by the way, they died. So if you want that kind of manna, great, but you're gonna, you know that you're not going to get eternal life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died in verse 50. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am a whole lot more than the manna that your fathers ate. I'm everything. And yet you have the audacity to complain and murmur. And then he builds it even more. He says, by the way, I want to make sure you get this one more time. I'm greater than the Old Testament manna. 
Like this is for 40 years, God rained down his manna every day. Dear Lord, that would get old, wouldn't it? You guys, we complain about pizza and Jimmy John's every time we record all the time, right? Hey, Panda Express was good. Apparently we need to go to Five Guys. <laughs> the point is this, like all of that, you guys, Jesus says, my work is greater than that. And he says in verse 51, kind of like with the exclamation point, kind of like the, here we go. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anybody eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Here's the point is that Jesus is saying, I am a sacrifice. I am literally atonement. I'm giving everything up for your life. Over and over, that's what he's saying. The bread that I'll give for the life of the world is my flesh. I am going to die on the cross so that you get life. Jesus says in John 3, we're not going to go there because of time. He died for the world in John 3, 16. In John 10, it says he died for the sheep. It says that in John 11, verse 50, he died for the nation. In John 15, it says he died for the friends. In Galatians 2, verse 20, if you'll go there, Kevin. In Galatians 2, verse 20, think about this. God gave himself of a sacrifice. Why? It says this, the life I live, okay, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He gave up his flesh so that we could have life. Now this language of flesh, honestly, I have no problem saying it's borderline creepy. People are like, what are you talking about? This, this flesh concept, like that's disgusting. And so in verse 52, here's what you have. Wearsby goes back to, remember, how are the crowd responding? First, they were seeking him. Second, they were murmuring and complaining, right? And then, I love what Wearsby says, they were striving. In other words, they were fighting and quarreling and arguing amongst themselves. It says this, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's gross. In verse 53, so Jesus said to them, I assure you, you have to participate. Look. I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. And Jews were literally taking this, literally. Whoa! In fact, go to John 2, verse 19. This is a problem they're constantly having. In John 2, verse 19 through 21. Okay, they're constantly taking him literally, right? Destroy the sanctuary and I'll raise it up in three days. What is he in verse 20, they're like, this sanctuary took 46 years to build. <laughs> and you'll raise it up in three days in verse 21. He was speaking about the sanctuary of his body. Over and over, this is an image that we have. You don't have to go there, but remember the Nicodemus and Jesus interaction. Hey, you gotta be born again. What do you mean I gotta be born again and go back into my mother's womb? Like, this is the mentality. They're struggling literally, and they're thinking, I don't understand this. And then they're going to Genesis, and they're thinking, you're not allowed to eat human flesh. That's cannibalism. That's even more repulsive. And so now they're like, we came for a sign, and now you're telling us to eat your body? Gross. And so it started with seeking and then murmuring. And then it was like, I don't like this message anymore. I don't, I don't like this. And it says, Jesus says, anybody who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I'm in verse 54. And I will raise him up on the last day. And the one, well, in verse 55, here it is. Because my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Wah! The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. In verse 57, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Like, he's just like, have you ever just like taken a theme and then just like shoved it down somebody's throat and then you basically choke them to death with this? He's basically saying, you, I mean, like, it's so weird. He's like, just one time, Jesus. Like, you don't have to say it over and over and over, but he's constantly emphasizing and remember, look at verse 57. He's tying the Father and the Son together. And in verse 58, this is the bread that came down from heaven. It's not like the father, the man of your fathers ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He's constantly telling him, I am the answer. I know this is a hard truth. And in fact, I know you don't even want to receive it. I know you don't even like it. But I'm going to say it over and over again until you understand, at least until you hear me. And he said these things in verse 59 while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. You know, when I said Jesus is shoving it down their throat, I, I, you know, I don't mean like that's what we should do and hit the streets and go shove this down the throat. I just feel like Jesus is taking one of the hardest truths literally in all of the scriptures, to be honest. And he's saying, I want you to eat my flesh. And he's not backing down from this. And then finally in verse 60, because the truth was so 
hard. What's the response from the crowd? It's pretty sad and it's pretty real in America today. In America today. Uh, they are departing. When many of his disciples, his disciples heard this, they said, this teaching is too hard. This hard it's hard. Who can accept it? And Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were complaining about this, he asked them, does this offend you? And then what if, what if you were to observe the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? <laughs> in other words, oh, by the way, that's, that's nothing. What if I began to tell you about the truth of where I came from and that you got to experience this? And in verse 63, he says, the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. So now he's even taking it one step farther. Oh, that whole flesh thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to get to that point. So you begin to understand just so you understand that like, we understand the whole flesh thing. Like we understand that the salvation is not in flesh. Wearsby even says, you got to remember in, in Romans, flesh is not good. You cannot find confidence in flesh. It has everything to do with the Spirit of God. And in verse 64, but there are some among you who, who don't believe. So he took the flesh component, you guys, to point them to the bread of life. And that bread of life, yes, comes through the Spirit of God. And that he, he's taking him through this progression, but most people don't want to go through this progression. Most people don't want to participate in the life of Christ. He says in verse 64, uh, again, if you would, for Jesus knew from the beginning those who would not believe in the one who would betray him. He says then in verse 65, he said, This is why I told you that nobody can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. So he's talking about, holy cow here, right? The, the God's sovereignty and then the human responsibility. And he says in verse 66, from that moment, many of his disciples turned back and no longer accompanied him. Hmm. Crazy enough, uh, Peter responds. And what Jesus says to the 12, you don't want to go away too, do you? Like, are, are you all going to back away? And Peter, I think he spoke too soon because he says, Lord, who will we go to? You have the words of eternal life. He's, he's speaking for everybody. But we know that that's not true. He says, we've come to believe and know that you're the Holy One of God. But what does he say in, in verse 70? Jesus says, didn't I choose you the 12? Yet one of you is the devil. So Peter spoke that all 12 are going to believe. But Jesus says, no, there's one of you that's not going to believe. He's referring in verse 71 to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, one of the 12 because he was going to betray him. Look, there's a lot here. There's a lot of truth that I think we, we need to continue to process and slow down and go back to, what is he talking about when he's talking about the flesh? He's saying, you guys, I need you to turn to me. It's not in the temporary. It's not in the food. It's not in the things that you can see. No, no, no. It's in the eternal. It's in everything that Christ is. And can I just go overboard here? It, it means living a lifestyle um, that's not comfortable. Participating in his flesh means you're willing to, it says in Mark 8, 34, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. Judas didn't want to do it. The challenge is, Peter did, and will we as well. All right, guys, this is John 6. Uh, I love this progression of the crowd, seeking, murmuring, striving, and departing. My prayer is, is that none of us in this group listening departs at all. Thanks, guys. We'll talk to you tomorrow.